Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Express Check-In. Today I'm recapping Tabletop Bellhop Live, Episode 30, Finding Your Yoda, The Quest for a Game Guru. I am Mo Tuzno, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back at the games that hit our tabletops in the last week. We finally had a full group of four players again and got to continue our Gloomhaven campaign on Friday night. Now, if you remember from our last campaign game, we had just taken out a Demon Lord and closed the portal to the Elemental Plane. A Demon Lord who asked us to get them an artifact. Well, this week, now that that demon's taken care of, we're going to hunt for that artifact. Now, I was pleased to learn this mission, which was number 22, Temple of the Elements, wasn't just about beating up all the monsters. There was more to it, and that felt great after a couple weeks of just random dungeons. Now, the game went well, but the conclusion led to something interesting. We now have two spots on our Gloomhaven map that no one can ever explore in campaign mode. Due to the achievements we've unlocked, we can't do this mission. And because this achievement is a global mission, we can't even make a new party and go scope it out which I thought was an interesting thing to know about Gloomhaven we didn't know going in. Now remember you can watch us stream our Gloomhaven games every Friday night, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, twitch.tv forward slash tabletop bellhop. You can also catch a slightly edited version of that actual play on YouTube. Those go out on Thursdays. Now Friday's Gloomhaven game ended early enough, we had time for one more game. That game was Azul, Stained Glass of Sintra. I gotta say, I am terrible at this game. The more I play it, the more I realize this. The strategy just hasn't clicked in for me. Now, my friend Sean Hamilton put it well when he noted that Sintra requires a different kind of thinking than the original Azul. And that's obviously a kind of thinking I haven't wrapped my head around yet. Now, Saturday afternoon, it was just me and my girls, and I took this chance to play some games with them. We played four kids' games of various quality levels. Up first, though, was Quirkle Cubes. This game was excellent. To me, it seems like a slight step up from Quirkle and an improvement on the original. Everything is identical, except instead of tiles, you have dice in six colors with the six shapes on the side of the dice. Each turn before placing your dice, you can roll any number of them. Everything else is the same. If you dig Quirkle at all, this is worth checking out. Up next was Professor Noggin's Creatures of Myth and Legend. This one wasn't so great. It's an educational trivia game that may be a solid educational tool, a step up from, say, flashcards, but isn't a very good game. Every game, you have to play through every single card, sometimes multiple times, and there's a ridiculous take-that mechanic that not only isn't educational, it's just also not fun. This one was a pass for us. Riddle Moo This is another trivia game. Well, rather a riddle game. This one is for younger kids, with extremely simple words guessed with three phrase clues. The draw of this game is probably the buzzers that come with it that make barnyard sounds, but these were so loud and so annoying that you could hear them two floors away. I'm sorry, but hard pass on Riddle Moo This. Now the final game we played was another win, and that was Battle Sheep from Blue Orange Games. This is a hex-based area control game where the players start with a stack of 16 sheep uh, tokens, or kind of like poker chips. Each turn, they have to split one, this stack, or one of the stacks they already have on the board, and move one part of the stack as far as they can in a straight line. Now, players continue to split their stacks until no one can move. This is an excellent game that even adults should enjoy. My only warning is that it's very confrontational, where most of your moves are going to be to block another player, so it might not be right for all families. Now, the last game I got in the last week was a big, epic game of Zaya Legends of Adrift System. My Kickstarter copies of all the expansions came in a little while ago, and I set up an event just to get to play last week. We played a big four-player game that lasted almost five hours. Now, Zaya is an epic sci-fi sandbox game where you start off with a ship and 4,000 credits and some tiles representing a small portion of the galaxy on the table. Pick a spawn point and go. Do what you want. Explore, set up trade routes, mine asteroids, become a pirate, hunt bounties, complete missions, upgrade and buy new ships, and probably three or four other things I'm forgetting. All in a race to a set fame point amount. We played to 15 points the other day. Now this is a fantastic space romp, but it's also highly random. There are a lot of dice in this game, a lot of dice rolling, there's card drawing, and random tile placements. Then adds a lot of random elements to the game, which to me means Zaya is not for everyone. 
Now, to me, you don't play Zaya to win. You play it for the adventure and the experience. Now, if you check out the full podcast, you can hear my thoughts on each of the expansions. The Cell Sword Kickstarter exclusive ship and NPC. The Big Box Embers of a Forsaken Star expansion. The brand new in 2018 Missions and Powers deck. And the new 2000 credit metal coins. Now, what I will say here on our Express episode that Embers is a must-have. If you have Zaya, try to find Embers. Now, while I was playing these games, Sean was busy playing a ton of card games. His family is still fighting through Box 1 of Harry Potter Hogwarts Battles expansion Monstrous Book of Monsters. He noted they've come very, very close, and it does seem beatable. Note, without any stacking of decks or cheating. Sean was also really happy to announce that his daughter has joined in on the fun that is the DC Comics deck building game. She's picked up the game very quickly and and has even managed to beat her much more experienced dad and brother. He wasn't expecting her to get into this game much as he's not much of a superhero fan, but he's found she really enjoys the competitive aspects of the games and seems to be hooked. Sean also noted his addiction to Ascension on Steam continues. He's been practicing playing offline games so he can get better at competing online. Now, as usual, this weekly look back only scratches the surface. For more discussion about these games, be sure to check out the full podcast when it goes live Tuesday mornings at 2 a.m. Eastern, both on YouTube, right here, and on your favorite podcatcher. Just one quick announcement this week. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. Once a week, I send it out, summarizes all our content we put out in the week previous. You can subscribe at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or just go over to the webpage and there's a spot on the sidebar where you can sign up. Ask the Bellhop. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. Last week, we talked about what to do when you've got a game with a terrible rulebook. And my final suggestion was to find someone to teach you that game. Well, this week, we have a direct follow-up to that suggestion. Today, we're answering the question, how do you find a tabletop teacher? My first suggestion is to hit up your local game store. That is, assuming you have one. Most game stores are going to have open game nights where you can show up, meet other gamers, and play games. They're usually filled with people excited to show off their recent acquisitions and old favorites. Many stores are also going to host game demo nights where they show off specific games. If there's a game you want to learn, try asking the staff if they're willing to do a demo or set up a demo night sometime in the future. Now, gaming cafes appear to be popping up everywhere, and the good ones not only offer great food, games, and a place to play, but have staff on hand not only to suggest games for you to play based on your preferences and gaming experience, but also to teach you how to play those games. Now, not every game cafe does have a game guru there to teach, but it's worth checking out to see if you can find a teacher there. My next stop would be a game convention. Most decent-sized cons are filled with representatives from various game companies and publishers, as well as game designers themselves, who are there specifically to get you to try their games. Now, they're usually experts at the games and well-trained in teaching techniques. After all, they're there to sell you that hot new game. Now, the cons are the perfect opportunity to learn how to play a game and a great chance to try before you buy. Now, even if the game you want to learn isn't being demoed at a con, there's a really good chance that the game is popular enough it's being played somewhere during the event. Whether that's a scheduled event, a tournament, or a pickup game in an open gaming area, you can usually find someone playing almost anything, and that's a great way to find a teacher. Even if you can't get into a game, perhaps you can ask if you can watch a game in progress just to learn to play. Now, in 2019, perhaps the best place to find a game teacher would be on the internet. Jump onto social media and post on your feed you're looking for a teacher. Or hit that search button and look for a local game group or fans of the game you want to learn. Now, personally, I found Facebook the best for finding local players, but Twitter has been great for getting answers to rule questions. Another great online resource for finding local gamers is meetup.com. Actually, it's great for finding local groups pretty much into anything. But I've had really good luck finding both RPG and board game groups through Meetup. And if you can't find a local group, one of the great things about Meetup is you can create a group yourself. Now, have we mentioned Board Game Geek on the show? Yeah, I know we have. Site's huge. It is a fantastic resource. It's so big, there is probably functionality of Board Game Geek you haven't discovered yet. And I'm certain there's functionality even I haven't discovered yet. Like, did you know there's local forums for pretty much every state, province, and country? 
like some of my regular game group, the guys I game with all the time, I met on Board Game Geeks Ontario forums years ago. Also, be sure to search Board Game Geek guilds for anything local. If that doesn't work, you could always try going to the game page itself for that game you want to learn, as every single game on Board Game Geek has its own forum once you scroll down. Just post there that you're looking for a teacher, and someone may point you in the right direction. There's an app for that. Well, kinda. Actually, I found all kinds of apps that were like dating sites for gamers, but I didn't really have much luck with them. I think you have to live in a big metropolitan area for these to work, but they may be worth a shot. Now, game nights at local libraries are becoming more of a thing. Now, I gotta say we don't have those here in Windsor yet, but it is worth checking for your local branch. You may just find your game guru there. Now, did all this work and still can't find someone local? How about just playing online? Nowadays, you don't even have to all be sitting at the same table to play and learn a game. With software like Tabletop Simulator and sites like Board Game Arena, a board game teacher may just be a screen away. Okay, my last suggestion, I like to sarcastically call the supermarket pickup. This is where you head out to your local Target or Barnes & Noble and wait for someone to head over to the game section and say pick up a copy of Catan, then casually approach them and say something like, so, you into board games? Okay, it doesn't have to be quite so creepy, but this is literally how I used to find new gamers back before the days of the internet, when we didn't really have a local game store in the area and just a hobby shop with a full games. I would hide out in the aisles of Leisure World and watch for someone to pick up a copy of White Dwarf or happen to glance at a copy of Talisman and then I'd move in. Now remember to check out the full podcast for a more in-depth discussion of this topic. I'm just scratching the surface here just giving you the, a brief overview of what we talked about on the main show. Do you have a gaming or game night question you'd like us to tackle on a future Ask the Bellhop segment? You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or you can head over to the website tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Remember that we record a new episode of Tabletop Bellhop Live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and we'd love it if you joined us in the lobby, our chat room. Now the edited podcast version of that live show gets released every Tuesday and you can find it here on YouTube or on your podcatcher under the Tabletop Bellhop Live. Now, if you enjoy this content we're providing, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Express Check-In. You can always find us across the web and social media as tabletop bellhop, one word, or drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Be sure to subscribe to our channel by clicking over here and check out our latest video by clicking over here. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge. Good night and game on.